while we're waiting, I will just introduce myself very briefly. Um, so my name is Spencer. I work for Project Jumpstart, which is a part of the Office of Entrepreneurship and Career Development. So we're like the student team and we organize events um, to try to bring resources to our student body. Um, we recently conducted some student surveys and got some fantastic results back just about things that um, students feel like they're missing or they need more of. And so we're always trying to find ways to bring uh, different things to the table. And I thought because it's spring semester and so many recitals happen in the spring semester, it would be a fantastic idea to have a workshop on recital program notes um, because a lot of us love to do recital program notes. Some of us want to and don't always have the opportunity. So we have with us today, Dr. Nelson, and I'm going to introduce them briefly while we're waiting just for the couple of other people that might join. Um, let's see. Oh, I think Dr. Nelson might have froze. Oh, there you are. You're back. Sorry, my ethernet accidentally came out. Oh, no problem. Okay, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction of Dr. Nelson. And then if anybody else joins, uh, that's no problem. So uh, Devin Nelson is currently adjunct assistant professor of musicology at Indian University, where they recently finished their PhD in musicology with a minor in historical performance. Their dissertation, The Antiquarian Creation of a Musical Past in 18th Century Britain, on the construction of antiquarian music publications and their foundation in a wider multidisciplinary antiquarian culture was completed in May 2020. Devin holds um, a Bachelor of Music from Roosevelt University's, University's Chicago College of Performing Arts, CCPA. They have presented at national and international conferences, including Indiana University's Historical Performance, Theory, Practice, and Interdisciplinarity Conference, the American Society for 18th Century Studies Conference, and the Utrecht Early Music Festival's STIMU Symposium, where they won the 2017 STIMU Young Scholar Award. Devin's article on the antiquarian perception of Charles Burney's history of music won the 2019 Hemlo Prize in Burney Studies and has since been published in the Burney Journal. They have written program notes for IU Opera Theater, including Chabrier's L'Etoile and Handel's Giulio Cesare. Devin's research interests include music and antiquarianism in Britain, music printing, historical instruments, issues of early modern music and dance, and connections between music and drink. So thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, for taking the time. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. I'm going to mute myself and take my hands off the, uh, the buttons here. Thanks so much, Spencer. Um, so I wanted to start today with what might seem like an unrelated example, but I promise it's connected. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all now see uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with this show, um, but has anyone ever watched uh, the next Food Network star on Food Network or other sources? Um, basically, it's a show, it's a reality show to like competition show to get your next uh, a show on Food Network. Um, and that job really involves describing food very well um, while you cook it and um, basically making people want to eat it. Um, so on many of the episodes, one of the hosts, uh, Giada De Laurenta, um, asked the contestants to describe a plate of food in a way to make her want to eat it. So they'll be sitting down to dinner together and they're all excited because they get to like have dinner with the star. Um, but their actual challenge is to describe what they're eating in a way that makes her want to eat it. Um, and what I found in, in watching this is that there are actually a lot of really interesting parallels to that process and how you want to describe music in a way that may make listeners want to hear it. So the contestants that didn't do well in this exercise uh, tended to just list the ingredients that they were eating. Um, you know, this includes tomatoes and lettuce and all these things, which you 
can either see or, but it doesn't really make you want to eat it, right? Just knowing what's in it. Um, or they would just describe it as yummy and delicious, which are fine adjectives, but again, doesn't actually help you understand what you will be eating. Um, so I thought this was a good way to sort of think about what you may or may not want to include in program notes. So I'm gonna drop um, a file in the chat, um, a little handout that will hopefully be helpful. Okay. Um, and I can also share this on my screen if that uh, helps as well. So this silly um, television show example um, sort of gives me ideas of, of how uh, you might want to describe music. So the, my guiding principle for program notes and, and most other musical writing is to describe it in a way that makes people want to listen. Um, and additionally, especially because you're dealing with historical repertory a lot and need to describe historical context, telling the audience why it matters and why they should care. Um, so there are a couple of pitfalls um, that come with this that I think people fall into a lot, or at least that I've I've noticed um, to avoid. And then we'll talk about some things to do, and then some sort of guiding principles uh, or other considerations that you might want to think about when writing program notes um, before looking at a couple of examples to pick apart. So um, a few of the things that you don't want to do, like the Food Network example, um, you don't want to give like a laundry list of ingredients. So for music, what that means is you don't want to give a play by play of what happens in the work. This is not narrating what's going to come uh, movement by movement. Um, while that has its place in, in some settings, it's really not interesting to read at all <laughs> um, and can take up a lot of space that you probably don't have. And uh, also is is just not the best way to to make someone want to want to listen to something by just like reading through uh, what happens at least musically in the work. Okay. Um, Another thing that you don't want to do um, is give a play-by-play -play of the composer's life. This is not the time or place for on a sunny day in August, this composer was born in this serene setting. Um, or if you've read um, The Hobbit, I think that the whole first chapter is The Hobbit does this, and The Hobbit does this, and The Hobbit does this, which is fine for Tolkien, but definitely not what you want to do for program notes. We don't need to know every job that this composer had. Um, there's a place for composer information but you need to be really, really selective about what happens. Um, again, like in the Food Network example, you don't want to use general words um, just as descriptors that don't really add value, like beautiful or interesting, like delicious or yummy, like that doesn't make me want to listen to a piece. Um, and it's, again, because program notes often have a, a premium in space, um, it doesn't really help um, what you're doing at all. It's great that a piece is beautiful, it's great that you think it's beautiful, but that's really not, um, or that this is particularly interesting, but tell us what about it is beautiful or what about it is interesting. Don't just say, okay, this beautiful melody, go a little bit more in depth, that's going to be more engaging um, than just using those basic descriptors. Also, really, really big thing, do not try to claim things that you cannot possibly know. Um, it's a huge trap to sort of think that we can know everything a composer was, you know, thinking or feeling when they wrote this piece, um, but that intentional fallacy is, is a huge problem. Um, so we can provide a lot of context um, or an appropriate amount of context for, for pieces, um, but we can't actually know everything that a composer was thinking when they wrote this particular work. So don't try to do that because it just it just ends in disaster usually or or an error um some things to make sure you do um is to thoroughly research your pieces using credible sources um that may seem like a no-brainer but um it's amazing how much that doesn't uh happen with program notes in particular so even though in program notes it's not um 
generally practiced to use footnotes or citations. Um, still, when you're initially writing them, I think it's really helpful to use those and to have a version of your program notes that is marked up with all the citations and where you get things from, um, partly so that you are rewording things appropriately in your own language. And also just if you want to expand it or do more research on it in the future, you have all those sources um, at your disposal. And then what you actually print um, excludes those things. So do make sure you're uh, thoroughly researching things. We can talk more about those methods if people are interested in that um, in the question session. Also, uh, one, oh, yeah, one thing, one huge pitfall that probably my most um, cringe-worthy moment of going to a recital and reading program someone's program notes um, is them thinking they know a term when they don't actually know a term. So sometimes like a little bit of information is actually the most dangerous because um, we may think we know a bunch of stuff um, and you probably do know a lot of things on it, but double check, triple check everything that you're doing and you may actually learn more about that particular piece um, or work in the process. So my my really cringy story involving this was going to a vocal recital where someone was singing um, air de cour as in C-O-U-R, but it was on a, a program um, that was supposed to be all love songs. And so the program notes went on and on about how these were songs of the heart. It's not the right Cor um, is the French car um, is spelled differently. So they went on and on about how these are love songs when they're actually C O U R is court songs. Very different, very different context. Um, so, so again, sometimes a little bit of knowledge is, is dangerous. Make sure you really know terms. And also in doing so, you'll make sure your audience really knows those terms too. Um, so one thing we want to know make sure of is that you're using um, terms that your audience will know or are able to give a very brief um, description of that term if you think they might not know it. Um, because using too specialized language is also something to avoid in program notes, um, especially for more general audiences, um, such as recitals at JSOM, you might have lots of um, community members, at least virtually or, or however things are working right now. Um, so another thing to do besides making sure you're researching and really knowing what you're talking about for all of these things um, is to give the reader some musical details to listen for. So again, it's, it's a balance. We don't wanna give a play-by-play -play of what happens in the work, but you do wanna give some a few like key things to listen for um, in this particular work. So basically a few things to latch onto, to look out for, listen for um, as they're going through the work, um, especially when there are things that might um, involve some type of a program or the text um, to listen for, or things that relate particularly to the historical context of the work. Those are good things to highlight because you can really um, bring a lot of information together succinctly, both things to listen for and um, contextual clues that are helpful. Um, so along with that, provide his, providing historical context, it helps the reader understand what they are hearing. So this again is not the time to tell every single detail about the premiere of the piece. Many of, many of much of the time, we can't even know that much about um, premieres, some more than others. This is not the time to go, you know, on a sunny day um, in February, this piece was premiered and the, there's this ornate decoration in the concert hall, that's not the time for this. Um, but you want to provide key pieces of historical context that might help. So um, my area of specialty is early music. Um, and so sometimes for uh, pieces of early music, the performance context is, is quite a bit different than we might perform it now, um, such as pieces for a small chamber ensemble being performed um, for particular courts in small rooms, whereas now it's in a huge recital hall where we have all these 19th century performance traditions, knowing that distinction of this would have been performed for a small audience in a small hall, um, that kind of thing can be helpful and thinking of what to listen for. Um, these works, works weren't meant to project to these huge audiences that we might have today. Uh, but you don't need to, again, go into every single piece of historical context. So 
these, a lot of these do's and don'ts can just be a matter of what side of the line, not giving too much information um, and overload, um, because also you don't want your audience to be sitting there reading through the entire concert. You want them to actually listen to you. At least that's what I assume. Um, so here are some additional considerations to help guide you um, in your writing. So um, a lot of these things will change based on what kind of concert this is. So first of all, know who your audience is, or at least think about who your audience might be, um, whether this is specialists, music enthusiasts, a mixed audience. Um, a lot of times you're you may not know, so you sort of have to aim for the middle of a mixed audience. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, use a language that they're gonna understand. So it's fine to use a few um, terms here or there, but you don't want it to all be complete like musical jargon. Um, they don't need to know the entire ins and out of a sonata form um, and go on and on about that when you have people who may not even read music. Um, but thinking about um, how your audience might like to learn how to listen to music is important. So again, writing about it in a way that makes them want to listen make, might um, make them think about um, how to listen to music. Um, and in doing so, this is sort of where these sonic markers come in um, with one of the do. So a few things to listen to for a few sonic markers to pick up on. Um, I find that often a blend of some history and some sonic markers are good. Too much of, of either can be sort of overwhelming. Um, but the more you can connect those sonic markers with um, historical context, the better. Um, for certain um, programs, it might be helpful to think about why this piece is important um, in the description, especially if you're going for a themed program or uh, something like an anniversary or underrepresented composers, um, those can be helpful things to um, consider. So what's your angle with your particular uh, program? If you have a theme or if it's um, just a collection of pieces is fine too. You don't have to connect all of them. And we'll see an example of, of doing that in a little bit. Another thing to think about is how much space uh, you have. Um, well, for a lot of your recitals, I, I'm not sure if there are particular lengths that are mandated by, by Jacobs or anything, um, but even if you do have unlimited space and you're just creating a PDF um, to go online or you're just writing them yourself, again, you don't want your audience to just be reading the whole time. Um, that's not the point of, of a recital. And audiences, I think, seeing a huge amount of text will sometimes get turned off by them and then just not want to read them in the first place. But at the same time, you don't want, you want a little bit more substance than like two sent sentences per work. So again, it's a balance. Um, formatting is also really important. So make sure that as you're going through these, that you're, you're checking and double checking everything. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen um, spelling and other such errors in program notes. Um, it's not a good look. Um, and I've included a few resources of, of how to format pieces consistently. Um, and all of these are actually currently available on Haithi Trust through IUCAT. So you can see all of them online right now. Um, and, you know, save them for yourself if you know how to do that. I won't go into that, but you know. Sorry, methods. Um, so be consistent with your formatting. Um, also, you can use formatting to sort of grab the audience's attention and help them uh, navigate your notes if they maybe only want to look up one work and not another work. And we'll look at an example of that in just a minute. Um, and then also think about what your audience needs in, in terms of translation and, and text um, and make sure that, again, your translations are from credible sources or that you're really doing your homework and doing that translating work. Um, so a lot of those things may seem a little bit self-explanatory, but again, they're um, good things to consider when you're writing program notes. So what I wanted to do um, next is to look through um, some examples to look for some of these features. So I think I'm gonna start. And I will put this in the chat as well. Um, so let me, there we 
Okay, so this is this example. Is everyone able to access these files that I'm sending? Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, sorry, Nicole, I just saw your, your comment. Um, I like that of not doing a, a ESPN play by play. There's a really funny comedic bit about that in Beethoven's Fifth, I think, but this is, again, not the place for it. Um, so this is one example of program notes that covers a number of pieces um, together. And like the last point we talked about um, before we go into these more um, specifically, um, one formatting thing I really like about this example is that they're highlighting the composer names and the piece names. Um, so while it is one um, fluid thing, you could, if you just want to skip to a particular work, easily find those things without having to go through um, every particular thing. Another thing that this highlights before we go into to specific things here um, is a program for uh, a themed program. So um, what I really like about this example is that the first two paragraphs give a nice like succinct summary of the theme of the program and why this theme is happening. This was a particular concert that was a collaboration from uh, the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra and I use uh, Latin American Music Center so it goes into a little bit about music in Latin America as an overview, again, very brief, um, but not too long um, before it really focuses on the examples in the program. So it's a really nice balance of just a little bit about the theme. You don't want to go on and on waxing poetic of, you know, music is, please, no, never, music is a universal language, just like don't do it. Um, you just sound like an undergraduate trying to fill space in a research paper, or even worse, an 18th century antiquarian who is trying to make universal principles when they just, it's problem. Anyway, don't do it. Um, but a little bit of sort of tying things together is helpful and just doing that very concisely at the beginning and then really focusing on the musical works is I think a really good way to go. Um, so those are some more general things um, about this. What I'd like to do now is maybe take a couple of minutes and let's see. Have um, yeah. um, so there are three works represented here. Um, so I might, if it's okay, if I use the breakout rooms sensor. Absolutely, yes. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, uh, and if I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms, and if each breakout room could read one paragraph. Um, so the first breakout room can look at the um, uh, this first main paragraph here, and the second group can look on the second paragraph and the third the third paragraph. Um, and thinking about what's good about this, um, what kind of information is included, um, and then anything you find that maybe is not appealing about this particular Does that make sense? Okay. I'll we'll just give you a couple of minutes. I think I'll just stay here with you. <laughs> I get to stay in the main room. This is actually a really good turnout. I think it may be recording. I'll just pause. Technical issue? I think so, yeah. Go us. It was just that the um, the files hadn't been saved by some of the participants, so when they went to the breakout room, they couldn't access the chat with the file, so they had to leave and rejoin. Yeah, if you're not on a computer, it does weird things, so. Yeah, now I'm looking at the chat, and it doesn't show the files, but I mean, I saved them right away. Good. I can always add them again um, if people need. I'm happy to do that, so. I'm just looking at your impressive book collection behind you. Thanks. It's really, you can tell where the label is the library's collection <laughs> that I'm hoarding. But. 
Are you the person I have to come yell at if I needed a book? And then it's like, it's been checked out for five years. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, most of them are from Wells, though. So they're, most of them are not music books, but. Yeah. I just hoard everything in PDF which is amazing because I played cruise ships and I was like, like you could not bring anything with you. And so I just started hoarding digitally. It just haven't stopped. Also good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's um, break this down a little bit. So like we said, the first couple of paragraphs just um, give you a context for the whole concert um, and how it relates to this collection. Um, obviously, this is a local concert, so they want to highlight local collections as well. Um, how about the first example? So group one, what did you find in this example? What was helpful? What was less helpful? Well, I think we both agreed that it was really beautifully written and it had so much information. Um, we know that the work is from a novel. We know that it was meant to be in a greater work. It's an overture to an opera that wasn't realized. We know what language it's in. We know who the main character is. And we have a pretty um, deep bio of the composer for so short a paragraph. So it's, it's very helpful to guide us through the piece. Yeah, and I think um, in a concert, again, with all of the program net writing, it's really helpful to think about the context of the concert. This being for um, this collaboration and purposefully to highlight the collections of the Latin American Music Center and Latin American composers, um, that kind of biographical information I think is particularly relevant in this case. Um, good, Any anything else that you noted about this? Yeah, I um, personally, I thought like when I've had to write program notes for classes or something like as an exercise, it's really kind of awkward to switch between like, you know, um, information about the composers or like information about what exactly um, the piece is like the, the origins or the history of the piece and like the historical context and all that stuff. Also including musical elements and like how you talk about that and it's really awkward to switch back and forth between the two or sometimes I find myself putting all of the historical stuff at the beginning and then like there's kind of a line of demarcation in my writing um, where it transitions into more of the musical writing so I think this is a great example um, even with just, just this one paragraph of like how whoever wrote this kind of is able to go back and forth between the two but keep it so that you're, as the reader, you're not like being jerked back and forth. So I thought that was really nice and something that I'll take from um, this for sure. Yeah, that's a really difficult issue to, to deal with. So I'm glad this gives you an example of, of how to do that. Um, contextualizing some of those musical features to help you blend those two styles of writing. It's a really good point. How about group two with the, the second example? Yeah. Um, oh, Carly, if you want to speak. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, we read through it and we agreed, like, uh, there was some good historical background, like tying the composer to the Latin American Music Center, um, but a lot of it maybe could have been shortened um, or just been a little bit more concise. Uh, it seemed to go on a little bit about who exactly he studied with and when. Um, and we kind of felt the same way about the description of the actual pieces. Um, but there were definitely good things to listen for. So, yeah, I think that this one did like a good job of, um, just to add on, uh, did a good job of like, definitely giving you things to listen for and giving you context about the composer but it just seemed like too much and like it seemed like they were giving a play-by-play -play of like measure by measure um some of the time yeah again so this is like a, a really hard line um to sort of navigate um and again it might depend on the the context right of of the concert for how much of each of those things you might want to think about um so one thing with the um, background is mentioning people that the audience might already know. Um, so like in this last example, yeah, it might seem like a little bit much to include um, Copeland and Hysteria and all these people, um, 
but one benefit of doing that is those are composers that more of the audience might know rather than Juan Arrigo Salas. Um, so again, more things to consider as we move between these examples. How about group three? Um, so I think we might have been a little confused about which example we were supposed to look at because we looked at the same example as group one. Uh, but sorry about that. Um, and I and I I think like we agreed on like most of the points. We thought it was a lot of very good information. Um, there was one part where I just felt like they could have they talked about the overture and then they mentioned the plot of the opera and then they went into the musical content of the overture and I thought it would have been nice maybe not to interrupt the mention of the overture with the plot um so maybe just reordering that and then the other thing we talked about was that um I just felt like the information was great it's just that I noticed that all of the sentences were um, like long compound sentences, and it might have been nice to have a little bit of variation in the length um, and content of the sentences because we kind of felt a little similarly similarly to group two that it was a lot of good information, but it felt a little overwhelming. So, yeah, those are really good things to think about as you're doing your own writing and editing your own writing. Um, uh, is to think about things like sentence length and types of sentences and to try to mix it up for your reader um, and then the order in which ideas come. Um, and one thing that might help with that that's that's often pretty helpful is to either send to a friend or to a colleague your program notes to to give some feedback before you send them in because sometimes it can when you're writing them you get so sort of caught up in the information it can be really hard to see that for yourself. Um, so I highly recommend sending it to someone that you trust to to read through or even someone that doesn't know much about music someone that might be in the type of audience you're looking for to read through it and asking them okay does this make sense do i need to you know explain more terms that can be a really helpful exercise um in in getting to know what your audience may or may not need to know in your program notes themselves um, and maybe even re help you rethink what you're performing as well any other thoughts on this example? Well, I think, I hope that gave you a lot of good things to think about. Um, I'm happy to take just general questions that you have now. Um, if you'd like, I have some more examples, but we don't have to, to go into them. Just um, for credit, this is um, an example of a program note by Christine Reich, who is a PhD candidate in the musicology program here and who writes for a lot of local orchestras because her husband is a conductor. Um, so she does a really great job with with writing a lot of um, instrumental program program notes. Um, any questions about writing program notes, research process, writing things, anything like that? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so well, I guess I have two questions. Um, so the first one is I've um, like, what do you do if the piece that you are trying to research, you can't find a lot of information about from like actual scholarly sources. And also how do you feel about citing other program or like using other program notes to write your program notes? <laughs> so as far as for citing other program notes, I would definitely look into who wrote them and when they wrote them. Um, because if you can't find a lot of information and that's the only information you, ca you can find, it might be worth in thinking about what kind of information they had access to. Um, if this is like, you know, high school recital or something like that, that's like probably not very well researched. But if this is like, you know, a DM candidate in, you know, a various instrument, they it's likely well researched. Or if this is like a, a lecture recital, especially, those are much um, better because they have to be um, have to have a certain amount of research often are led by a research director. So it just really, I think, depends on who is writing them. Um, also, if it's a professional, if it's a, you know, well-known scholar who's writing these, um, that's also another pretty reliable source. So it just really depends on who is writing them. Um, if you are, obviously don't 
copy what they're doing without credit, um, but to use them as a source of information when you can't find anything else. Um, again, I would keep a version for yourself that is cited to make sure that you are rewording things um, and you are using your own language and not plagiarizing from them is really important. Um, so keep, really keep track of the differences there. But yeah, if it's a credible person, I think it's it's fine to use that when you cannot find other things yourself. Um, when you can't find anything or very much, I think the best thing to do is um, there's a couple couple strategies. First of all, when you can't find things specifically about that work, um, it might be helpful to think about the general type of work it is and the context for those types of works. Um, so again, my context is early music, so you might not know like a particular place for one particular song, but you might know that type or genre of song was performed in this general setting. Um, and for this more general context, like a particular court. Um, and so you could talk about that context without knowing specifics about that song, if that makes sense. Um, also, when you don't have a lot of like biographical information about the composer or anything like that, focusing, then I think it's more appropriate to focus more on musical content when you just don't have as much historical background. So trying to do a little bit more general historical um, background than you might if you knew things about the composer and then focusing on musical elements, I think would be my way around that. Thank you. Any other questions? Honestly, my my personal questions, I thought I was going to have a bunch, but a lot of them were really answered. I think the biggest takeaway for me was uh, choosing the uh, to use like a larger format and and bolding specific things, because what I typically do is I use um, a, a short annotation to each uh, movement, but then it's so much text. Mm -hmm. And I think your point about not having so much text that it's overwhelming so that the audience still wants to read something is, was really helpful for me. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I love reading program notes. Uh, I'm a musicologist, I'm a nerd, so I like reading stuff like that. Um, I mean, I like, I probably like reading longer things than a lot of audience members do. That's what I meant by that. Um, but even so, if it's like super, super long, like you don't want to read half of a novel or trying to cram it in, because I often like to try to read them before the concert starts so then I can just listen. Um, and different audience members have different feelings on that, I know, but um, but yeah, I don't, if it's too much, then I'm like, oh no, I have to like read like three pages before, like four pages before the concert starts. Um, so yeah, trying to edit yourself. And it, I think, so another general thing that's just good for writing in general is to have multiple drafts. So it's fine to have a first draft that has tons and tons of stuff on it, um, but then, I don't know, my, my friend sent me this a long time ago for editing. If you've ever seen the Parks and Rec episode where they're like slashing the budget and Ron has those little signs that say slash it, that's my like mental image when I'm editing anything. And I think program notes in particular. So having like a longer version that might have a lot of historical context and then just taking out as much as possible to what's really, really essential, just completely slashing it, no mercy. But then you have all the information for yourself um, as a performer, for your own knowledge and for the future if you wanna write more more about it. I think that's a good um, method to go through. Well, if nobody else has anything, I just want to say thank you again for yeah, taking for the time me. to uh, host this workshop with us. I think I certainly learned a lot. It seems like everybody else had some wonderful questions. Um, does anybody have any final questions for Dr. Nelson today? Or if you need to me to add anything else to the chat, um, I'm happy to do that. So, and feel free to here. I can forgot to put my email. Um, you just put my email in the chat if you have any questions or want to follow up with anything. Just let me know. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, thank well, thank you. you, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Dr. Nelson. Um, everybody, have a great day. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Nelson and we will get back to you.